It was a Saturday night. We were all at my house in Peckham. They were having, like, a lads' night out, and I was honorary girl. We were drinking, like, you know, that overproof rum and uh, getting quite giddy and drinking Stella and being all rah. We were going to go out and as we got to the end of our road, we saw the bus was coming, so we had to leg it. You know, we were sort of carrying cans of beer and trying to run and none of us are very fit. Just made it all pile onto the bus and so from running we were all like even more giddy. It was at full bus. People like us going on a night out, all sorts of people. Got to Peckham and a little lad, he was like maybe about 12, a small teenage boy. He jumped on the bus um, and sort of got on one of the seats and sort of got his knees up and sat, sat on the seat. He was scared and he crouched up straight away. And then, you know, sometimes the bus doors close, but there's still people wanting to get on the bus and bang on the door. And a big group, somewhere between 10 and 15, teenage boys and girls, ran onto the bus. They seemed older. And they had, like, belts and sticks. They just, um, they just started battering him. It was just a bit like, whoa, what's going on here? And it was scary. Cos he was sort of sitting like this and, and sort of, uh, you know, is anyone going to help me? And the first thing you sort of ask yourself is, am I going to do anything about it? Geraldine and I had been to a lovely concert with a friend of ours and so we were mellow and uh, we were walking back to the car and just sort of chatting and, and you know, had a good evening. It was about half eleven. We were coming up Lower Marsh and I know Lower Marsh quite well because I work there, so it's very familiar. You know, I usually feel very safe and secure walking up Lower Marsh. So we were one side of the street and there was this noise the other side of the street. It seemed like a row that was going on between three blokes. And it's the sort of thing you see in London or anywhere all the time. So that didn't particularly give us cause for concern. And we're obviously closing on them and they're coming our way but on the opposite side of the road. It seemed very heated and... The next thing I saw was that one of the men actually uh, threw a punch. It was violent enough to uh, deck him. You know, he went down like a sack of spuds. And from that point, it seemed to accelerate incredibly fast and the guy on the floor was being kicked. It was as if the bloke's head was a football and he was taking a penalty. He was really kicking him hard in the head and the chap's head was lolling like a rag doll. The image of it will last me for the rest of my life. His head was being kicked savagely. One of the men was wearing a suit and looked fairly respectable, but he was really laying into this bloke. It was like he was enjoying it. The guy on the floor wasn't really defending himself. He wasn't putting his arms up or trying to protect himself. I was thinking, he's not going to survive this. You know, no one can survive this amount of brutality. 
there weren't any passers-by. It was weird. You know, it, it was this strange hiatus in the middle of London where everything seemed to have stopped. We work all day on a Saturday till five. And I've been at work, just a normal day. And I was due to go and see my girlfriend. And her lad phoned me up and asked me if I'd pop in the shop and just get him something on the way over. Pulled up outside the shop and there was no other vehicles there. So I parked right outside the doors. I went in, got a couple of bottles of pop and some sweets, I think. And I was just talking to the girls who was behind the till, and I was just about to leave. And um, we heard the electric door go. And as you do, looked over at the door. And this guy was stood in the doorway, completely blacked up. Black sort of balaclava, face mask, something. Couldn't see his face. Couldn't see his hand. Black gloves. Couldn't see his hand. And he was holding a black bag. And he got this bag right up to his chest like that. And he was just stood there. I thought, that's somebody playing trick or treat, you know. I thought it was a bit late for trick or treat. And then this other guy comes barging in behind him. And he got a pistol in his hand. And he got it up like that, like Bond running into an action scene. And he, you know, shouted over, opened the safe and put all the money in the bag. The pistol at the ready. And I look back, and there's these two girls. And the younger one, I mean, her, her eyes were like saucy. They were just like huge with horror. And I'm stood there, the only bloke there, and this girl, like, absolutely terrified. You know, what do you do? The last thing you expect when you're popping in a local shop is somebody to walk in behind you with a gun. It all happened so quick, but it all happened so slowly. There's not time to think about it. It's, um, you certainly can't plan for it. You know, you've just got to do whatever your instinct tells you at the time. There was nobody else to turn to. There was only myself there, so it seemed that it was my place to try and do something about the situation. I'd got to sort of act, really. So I said, think about it, chaps. I said, um, it's Saturday night. These girls, they won't have a combination for the safe, you know. There's no way they can open the safe. I said, cut your losses and, and leave now before the situation gets any worse. And this guy with a gun, he just thrust the gun in my face, shouting, get on the floor, get on the floor, get on the fucking floor. And I thought, well, if I go down on the floor, he's only going to shoot me in the back or kick me head in or something. And um, I thought, well, that's not an option. So I sort of put my hands out towards him and said, uh, you know, sort of calm down. I was trying to, like, keep my hands low to not upset him. I was like, calm down, calm down. And he was just waving this gun in my face. And then the gun went off. The fact that it missed me, um, you know, was just um, either God on my side or, or just, just a stroke of luck. And then as he pulled the gun back, he managed to get a magazine out of his pocket or something. And it looked like he was going to put this magazine in the gun and reload it. And I thought, I thought, well, it's now or never. So I lunged at him and grabbed the pistol with both hands. And I smashed him off the shelves. And he smashed me back at the shelves and we were wrestling over the gun. And while I was trying to, like, twist him round, turn him. I noticed a knife in his other hand. I just saw the sparkle of the blade. It looked about like three, three and a half inches long. And this blade was coming at me. It's just so absolutely unfair, ten against one, with sticks, you know, and belts. It, it just seemed really cruel.
I was with a gang of lads, you know. I'm, I'm a girl on a boys' night out. I sort of thought, is any of the lads gonna step in? And everyone was just like, just leave it. And I sort of said, you know, oh, shall I, shall I go and guard him, you know, step in front of him, try and get in, in the way? You know, everyone, everyone's like, no, don't be stupid, don't be stupid. And I sort of looked around, you know, trying to catch people's eye on the bus, like, but everyone was very much almost pretending it wasn't happening. Unless you get stuck in straight away, it becomes harder and harder to step in because, because it, as it goes on, you sort of think, well, it might be over in a minute. You know, the bus driver's probably going to kick him off the bus in a second. I think everyone was scared. Not scared of what was actually happening, but I think you're scared of what could happen. There's this sort of contagious thing, OK, no one's acting, therefore it reinforces this sense that it's right not to act. And no one did anything. Um, I, didn't, I didn't do anything. After it had been going on probably just a couple of minutes, the bus driver must have pulled up opened the doors and just told them to get off. The lad got off and they all chased after him. It was almost like we all sort of... You, you sort of come together to acknowledge, phew, that's over. Um, and I suppose by sort of... By coming, coming together and... and Finally, you know, having a bit of eye contact and having a bit of an acknowledgement that something had happened. Um, it is a way of sort of being relieved, but also forgiving each other, perhaps, you know, um, and forgiving yourself. It quickly turns from being something you sort of feel bad about, ooh, I should have stepped in, you know, we very quickly went through reason after reason after reason when we were talking about it throughout the night of why it was definitely right not to have stepped in. You grow up believing, like, someone will help me if I'm in, in trouble. You once believed that, you know, someone will come to my rescue. <laughs> what view of humanity are you going to grow up with if that very basic hope that if you're in trouble, someone will come to your aid, if that has been absolutely proved not to be the case for you. late night shopping at Ikea. And I came home to Waterloo Station, which is near where I live, and I was walking home from the station at about half 11 at night. I've never felt particularly at risk in, in London, walking around late at night. I'm a fairly um, large bloke, and although I wouldn't know what to do in a fight, I've, I've never felt I'm likely to be um, targeted. I became aware that as I was walking away from the station, there were a couple of guys coming down the road. I can remember that they're really young. They can't have been more than early 20s. One of them's wearing a suit, uh, and they're both clearly drunk. And the one who's wearing a suit is 
what I can only describe as calling me names. He's in a sort of bumbling, drunken fashion, trying to wind me up, I think. And I can't remember exactly what he was saying, but it was on the level of, haven't you got big ears, mate? Whatever it was, it was really childish and a bit odd, but not threatening. They start this, I don't know, as they're 10, 15 metres down the road. So I'm, I, I'm sort of walking past them, and he's kind of doing this all the time that he's coming up to me. And then there comes a point where we pass each other, and then they're heading off, I guess, towards the station, and I'm heading off towards where I live. And at first, I just try to ignore it. And then after a while, I thought, well, this is, this is just out of order. At that time, I used to challenge antisocial behaviour quite a lot. I used to sort of see it as my sort of duty as a citizen. Uh, and partly because I didn't feel remotely threatened by this, I said something. Now, I can't remember what I said, but I'm pretty sure it wasn't, oi, mate, do you want to fight? Because I've never been in a fight with anyone. But whatever it was, it was enough because the immediate response to what I said was, uh, one of a guy said, oh, you shouldn't talk to my mate like that. And the other guy just looked livid and came flying towards me, absolutely charged with anger. The next thing I remember is being on the ground and a boot repeatedly striking me in the head um, and being curled up. Um, and this boot coming and coming and coming and not knowing how to stop it. I can remember feeling completely helpless. The actual attack happened so quickly and my memory of it is so riddled with black holes that I don't know if at that moment I thought, oh God, I'm gonna die. In that sense, it was like something out of a nightmare where you suddenly realise everything has changed with almost impossible speed. It seemed so unfair, so unprovoked, this attack. I'm not the sort of guy that gets stuck in. I really am not. But I lost it. I, I thought this is so unfair. I was incandescent with rage. I was shocked at myself, at being so angry. He was shouting um, at the chap, sort of saying, leave the guy alone, leave the guy alone, what are you doing? He was incensed. And I could feel the anger coming from him, and I was sort of holding on to him and saying quietly to him, don't go yet, don't go yet. I wanted to protect Howard. Geraldine was begging me not to go over there, but I, I was not thinking rationally. My instinct was to go over and, I don't know, but to just to make him stop kicking this bloke in the head. I was saying to him, I will phone the police and the ambulance. We'll stop it that way. Don't intervene, you'll get hurt. But he was carrying on anyway. I think I said, you know, what the fuck do you think you're doing? And I was shouting really loudly. I think in the back of my mind, I had the idea that if I made enough noise, someone would come. The guy who was doing the kicking looked up and, 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 and said, what the fuck do you think you're doing? Uh, I'm going to come and f fucking kick your head in. You're next. He did move across the street a bit, so I thought actually he was going to come and attack Howard. At that point, I was really, really scared and I was shaking. When the blade hits you, it's like the big electric shock. He just like thrashed away at me. He stuck one in my elbow and it went in an inch and a half up my elbow. He got me in the ribs, but luckily it was across my ribs, it didn't go through them. And he got me up the back of the neck, and he did a big swinging blow over, and he, he hit me right in the shoulder, in the flesh, 
and he put a three inch hole down my shoulder blade. And then he slashed my stomach. You could feel this dragging sensation that the knife was being torn through your flesh. Then finally to finish it off, I dug the knife right in and then he sort of like wiggled it about. That was like the final straw, that was the, you know, the, uh, uh, you know, that's gonna, that's it, that's enough, I can't take any more of this. That's when I let go of the gun. And um, he realised he'd done enough to, uh, to stop me. And he fled out through the door. There was just blood just pumping out of me and absolutely just blood all down my jeans, all down my shirt, all, all over my shoes. I sort of looked down and there was um, actually a piece of me hanging out. I'd only got a, a shirt and, a, and a, a light fleece on. And there was a sort of a bit of me hanging out. So I was sort of holding on to that, was staggering about a bit. They fetched me a stool and I sat on this stool and I got my mobile out and I was going round to my girlfriend, so I cursed through the menu. I found my girlfriend's number and I pressed the, the dial button and I found my girlfriend and I said, um, I mean, she knew I was going to the shop and I said, I'm in the spa shop, I've been stabbed. Um, and she was actually a nurse and she said, well, I'll, I'll be with you as quick as I can. And I cursed through the menu again and I got to home and I went to press the, the dial button and I couldn't, I physically couldn't press the button. I was trying my damnedest and I, I found it on the menu, but I, I hadn't got the strength left to push the button. The adrenaline had died down and I was sort of like going cold. It was all sort of quiet, it had all happened. I was there on my own, bleeding away, and I just thought, well, I hope this isn't the end, I hope this isn't going to be the end of it now. He was threatening to come over and sort me out next. I think I said, I don't care, I'm phoning the police. Because I was so angry, I really didn't care. I just was so angry at this man. I hated him. I had a phone in my hand and I was saying, I'm calling the police. There was no juice in the phone, but I was making as if I was calling them. I felt such an idiot. That I'm not great with technology and it was classic that when I needed my phone the most, the thing didn't work. Anyway, I was bluffing, uh, but it, it got his attention. He started to turn round and walk away. He didn't run away, so he wasn't scared. He just sauntered off up Lower Marsh. We knelt down and talked to the person, and he was talking, although he wasn't being totally lucid. I was really worried that he would slip into unconsciousness and that would be it. I put my coat around him and I think I had a, a clean hanky that, you know, used to stem the bleeding. He was sort of in a kind of, um, I suppose, kind of fetal position, kind of curled up. There was a lot of blood and I could see immediately, you know, the blood was coming from his head. There was a huge swelling on his head. It uh, looked like it was filled with fluid. I thought that th there was something, some ticking time bomb, some, some um, blood clot or something like that in his brain and uh, that he would die. I felt really powerless. I wanted to do something. I wanted to, well, I just wanted him better. You just hope you're gonna last. Where the bloody hell's that ambulance, you know? God's sake, I need, you know, I need something and, you know, God's help or, you know, something, you need something. My girlfriend arrived and she rushed over to me and she grabbed hold of me and gave me a big cuddle and 
I kept saying it would be all right, you know, just keep going. What you really need most when you're in that position is you need human contact. It's the biggest mender that there is. It saved my life, I'm sure of it. Absolutely positive. I think I'd have probably passed away without that help. And I think that would have been it. I was only 12 years old and I was with my best friend at the time. We decided to have a really girly night in. Her mum just bought us a movie and we wanted to get some fruit and like yoghurt to make a smoothie. And we've walked outside Asda, we've got on the bus. It was a packed bus. All the seats were full. There was people standing up. We were just sitting there talking and some girls came on the bus. They were a lot older. They were quite rude. They've looked at us. They've caged us in like they sat in front next to us, on the side of us. So there was a whole group of them and there was just us two in the corner. They asked us for chewing gum. And you don't really ask a random person to have chewing gum. So my friend gave her her packet and she's passed it round the whole group. Just finished her whole pack. And then she's gone, is that OK? Like, really intimidating, like, you can't say no. I think we're very nervous. We looked at each other and, like, we blushed. And then she's gone to me, like, do you have a quid you can lend me? But we'd just gone shopping. We honestly had no money on us. I said, I'm sorry, I have no money on me, and I've gone, I've just spent it. And, like, I've replied nicely because I don't want to be rude, like, maybe she needs it. The girl was a lot taller, I had to look up to her when I was speaking to her, which also made things worse, you know, that she was a lot bigger than me and, like, looking down on me. My friend was all tied up in the corner, frozen. The girl told me to stand up, so I stood up. I didn't really want to say no because it's a bit of an awkward situation. And then she searched me. She went for my pockets and I had my keys in my pocket. She goes, what's that? And I've got my keys. And she goes, OK, then you can sit back down like she was ordering me about. People saw her search me. I was looking at them, trying to catch their eye, maybe, you know, so they could help me. I felt humiliated, but I also I felt very scared. I was trying to keep a very small talk because I didn't really want to have a big conversation with them in case it led to something, in case I said something wrong that wouldn't appeal to them. She asked me what religion I was, she asked me if I was Jewish, and then I've gone, no, I'm English, which obviously didn't make sense. And I was very paranoid and, like, shaky. My friend goes, let's get off the bus. And she's just stood there, like, going, you're not getting off the bus. And we've gone, please. And she's gone, no, you're not getting off the bus. And I've gone, please, can I get off the bus, please? And I've, I've shouted it so everyone else can hear. And people look back and they didn't do anything. They could see there was a whole group of people against two little girls. And then she's come up to me with her phone and started tapping it across my cheekbones. She went like that, like, like pushing my face side to side. The girls were just laughing, going, do it, do it, do it. Then she's punched me. I knocked out on the floor. And then she was on my face, on my chest, jumping, kicking my face, stamping on me, and, like, jumping from the chair onto my face. The next thing I remember is me screaming and screaming and hoping someone would hear me because it was a single-decker bus. I'm sure someone would have heard me. I'm sure loads of people heard me. They just didn't want to get involved. There was a man sitting at the back bit of the bus, and he obviously heard it all. There was women, there was older people. 
and they were just all sitting there, like, minding their own business. And I've gone, help me, just someone help me. And some lady's turned around, she's gone, shh. I honestly thought it was a really bad dream. It felt like it was just going to keep on going on and on and on, and it was never going to stop. She just kept on jumping and jumping and jumping. She didn't stop and then someone's gone, stop. One of her friends, they've gone, stop, it's enough. If you're hurting, I can't walk past you without seeing if there's something I can do. Every person that I meet is part of my world. Fleetingly, probably, in most cases. But you know, if, if you are hurt, I'm hurt. How could I not be involved? I don't expect somebody else to do things. I expect me to do something. I expect you to do something. Liam was very much a free spirit quite an individualist. He had his own take on things and that became very obvious from an early age, you know. He wasn't happiest at school, he was happiest outside. We spent a lot of time on the downs, in the woods. He was given an SAS survival handbook and he taught himself to make bivouacs and he could track things, and he claims to have eaten a hedgehog, which caused everybody considerable distress. I hope he was lying. <laughs> he took up skateboarding when he was about eight. All the people who knew him really well would say he was lousy at using a skateboard. He used it as transport. He used to hang about with the skateboarders down in the centre of Bristol. They treated him as a sort of uncle. He found it very hard to settle to anything. The only thing that he really enjoyed doing was cooking. But he never took it seriously in terms of making money. What he was interested in was making good food. By the time he got into his 20s, he met a girl that he'd gone out with when he was a teenager. They started going out with each other again and fell in love as adults. So they were going to get married the next year. He wasn't working that day. He got a telephone call from his friend Ian asking if he could go and meet him down on the green. So they went to a record shop and chatted to a couple of people. They were walking by the waterfront. And suddenly Liam's attention shifted and he said, hang on a minute, and put his bag down and shot off to where there was a group of kids who split in half as he reached them. And three young people shot off in one direction. And the other group of young people surrounded Liam and Liam fell down. When Ian saw the blood on Liam's chest, he realised that he'd been stabbed. And uh, seconds after that, he said Liam became unconscious. He saw his eyes glaze. So he started doing mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation. That transpired there was a group of young people from Bristol who had been going around the area robbing people and the young people who fled were little country kids so they were picked on by this crew of urban chaps who decided that they were going to have their mobile phones and um, their money 
and they had handed them over at the time that Liam was walking past. Liam had a pretty rotten time as a kid and he, it made him very angry to see people bullying people. If he saw somebody being robbed, he would actually put himself in between the robber and the person being robbed. He'd done it several times. The guys who surrounded him objected to the fact that uh, Liam apparently put his hands on one of their bikes and said, how would you feel if I said, give me your bike? I think they demonstrated how they'd feel because one of them tried to hit him on the head with the bike seat and another one stabbed him in the heart. In the hospital, there were people running to and fro and announcements. You know, would all available medical students come to resuscitation room too? I, mean, I realised that that uh, what was happening to Liam was of considerable interest to people who were studying medicine, which didn't fill me with a great deal of hope. When he'd stopped crashing, they did an emergency thoridectomy, which meant they cut him in half so that they could get to his heart and mend a little hole. It was a tiny little hole. The repair to the heart was fine, actually. His body mended itself but they had him extremely heavily sedated to perform the operations. Over the three days, they reduced the amount of anaesthetic and there was absolutely no response, not even autonomic responses. His blink reflex was absent. He wasn't swallowing. I think we all realised he wasn't, he wasn't there. I wouldn't want to be in a body like that. I don't think he would. So when they did the last EEG and they said there is nothing, we advise you that we would like to turn the machines off, we agreed. We actually just sort of took a group decision, decided that that was the kindest idea. So we all the people who loved him best actually stood round his bed and um, held his hands and his feet and held each other's hands. We turned the machine off. waking up in hospital with the policemen and doctors and nurses around me. I was desperately trying to piece together what had happened. There would be no moment where I'd ever seriously come anywhere close to contemplating my own death. And this really felt like it was, it was pretty fucking close. Just a few centimetres over, it would very easily have blinded me. And if he kicked a bit harder, and more to the point, if he kicked for a bit longer, uh, I could have been very seriously um, brain damaged or worse. I'd been told that there was someone who, who had helped, who had certainly called the police and called the ambulance, and I knew that they'd even called the hospital afterwards to find out how I was. But because they were a witness, I wasn't allowed to speak to them. I discovered that this person, at risk to himself, had challenged the guys who were doing this and had gone to some lengths to stop what they were doing. And because I know exactly how psychotic and violent these blokes were, I know that that was a, a risky thing to do. I realised there was a complete stranger to whom I owed a hell of a lot, to whom potentially I owed my life. 
in a weird way, being attacked restored my faith in human nature because someone who knew nothing about me was prepared to take this immense risk. I thought I was going to die. It was the scariest thing that's ever happened to me. I remember just being on the floor, her jumping on my face and my chest, um, like my tummy. I packed a bus and I was 12 years old and no one did anything. It's just disgusting. It really is, it's just, it's immoral. I don't understand why they couldn't call the police, why they couldn't tell the bus driver, why they couldn't shout and say something. You look up to adults thinking, yeah, they're responsible, they're mature, they're wise. But adults are just like children. They freeze up, they don't do anything, they have no common sense. They only think about themselves and their family. They wouldn't think about anyone else around them. So I don't really trust any adults anymore. I fractured an eye socket and then I had like all bruising underneath like the bone and this eye was all red as well. All my hair was coming out, I lost so much hair. I had nightmares for months, every single night. Like her coming into my house or her following me. Your confidence goes down, you're always scared. Even if you're safe, you think that you're not. I didn't go out of my house for a couple of months. I didn't want to go to school. I'd lock myself in my room and wouldn't eat. I was always arguing, always angry. I still get the odd feeling when someone comes on the bus and gives me a dirty look. I always had the fear that it would happen again to me. After my GCSEs were moving to Canada, I want to get rid of the past completely. I want to be able to know that I don't have to face those arrogant people who don't care about anyone else on the bus. I don't have to like, know that I could go past them and smile at them nicely, knowing that they didn't care. Liam died. Then there was the build-up to the court case. After the court case, that's it. You're all released into the wild again to get on with it and survive or not survive as you may. What actually happened to me was I raced along like a train on a track and then fell off the end of it. And I was quite nuts for two years. I was so angry about the fact that just in a snap, in an instant, um, my son's life was taken and thrown into space. The world that I could deal with shrunk to my immediate family. The rest of the world could have gone to hell in a handcart, as far as I was concerned. How can I not regret the fact Liam's not here. I wouldn't want him to have been different. I can say that. I couldn't possibly say that I didn't fully support his action. Of course I do, because I completely understand it. I understand that far more than the don't get involved. And I would fully support anybody in my family, anybody I know, who feels that they have to get involved. I think your interactions with other people are what make you human. That whole language of have-a-go heroes it tends to focus very much on, on 
the bravery of the individual and and, um, and that is incredibly impressive in the case of anyone who intervenes but what what you forget, unless you're lucky enough to be someone like me who, who, who was on the receiving end of that bravery, is, is what is the gift it gives to me and everyone I care about. So it's not just bravery in an abstract sense. It's something that, that affects this vast number of people. Everything that's happened since then is somehow has got something to do with him. I've never even met him, which is... Hello. Hi, mate. How are you doing? I'm very pleased to see you. Yeah. Probably better than the last time you saw me. Yeah, yeah. Hello. Well, um, I, you remember Geraldine, don't you? I, I, apart from anything else, I have not the slightest recollection of either of you. So, what? It's weird, but oh, do you, you have any recollection? Oh, I mean, just <laughs> no, I don't. So, look, how have you been? I've been wonderful. Yeah, no, I made a phone call. I felt a little uncertain that it was them because I have absolutely no recollection of them. In a way, I don't see this as closure. This meeting of Peter, I think, is a beginning for, for us three. I guess I'd always been thankful that someone was there, but now I'm thankful that it was them and that it was people who, who cared enough to do something.